Brian has written a best-selling historical narrative and travel memoir entitled Disappointment River. It is now for sale on the back and he has autographed it for us in memory of NOAA 2019. So 14 years before the Lewis and Clark expedition, Alexander Mackenzie set out to find the long hoped for, long wished for, fabled Northwest Passage. Now, Brian retraced Mackenzie's route. So Brian in his book, not only talks about the explorations of Mackenzie, but he, he also talks about his adventures in retracing the route. So Brian had to survive whitewater rapids, exhaustion, exposure, hungry bears, and even hungrier mosquitoes. So his book, Disappointment River, was named a best book by Amazon. Brian's first book is a war memoir entitled The Long Walk. Brian served three tours of duty in the Middle East. And he served as a, an explosive ordnance disposal unit, the head of that unit. So whenever IEDs were discovered, he and his men would disarm the deadly devices, hopefully with robots and other means. Someone would, if that didn't work, someone would have to take the long walk, suit up, and disarm the devices by hand. For his military service, Brian received the Bronze Star. The long, the long walk was named a New York Times editor, editor's pick of the year, and it was also turned into a successful opera. Brian's journalism and essays have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Foreign Policy, and on National Public Radio. In March 2018, he joined Amnesty International as a senior crisis advisor. Brian is a graduate of Marquette University and has a degree in electrical engineering, which probably came in handy with those IEDs. Brian. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that very kind introduction. Uh, Disappointment River is my third book. Uh, David already mentioned the uh, uh, first couple that I had done. Uh, I started by writing about the military. So yeah, I was an explosive ordnance disposal officer. I did a couple tours in Iraq. Um, and after, after that, I became a contractor, and then I became a writer. And so I, uh, um, my first book, The Long Walk, was about my, my time in Iraq. I wrote a lot about bombs. Uh, I wrote a second book called All the Ways We Kill and Die, which was also, it was about a buddy who died in Afghanistan in 2012, and the bomb maker, and what we know about the bomb maker and the, the search for him. It was like, uh, it was a true, crime, a true crime book, again, about bombs. I became a journalist, um, wrote about Afghanistan for Esquire again, went back to northern Iraq, uh, after ISIS and Mosul and Talifar and went into like ISIS bomb making facilities, uh, wrote some stories about that. Again, it's about bombs. Uh, when I was going to write a third book, I promised my wife that it would not be about bombs again. <laughs> and, I was, and I was searching for a new topic. Um, and so I, I had always wanted to take a trip like this. I've always been fascinated by books that are a combination of history and travelogue uh, and that kind of journalism. And so when I stumbled upon the story of Alexander Mackenzie, I knew I wanted to write about it. So I'm going to read from the very beginning while they figure out the slides. I'm going to read only two pages, I promise, very briefly. Um, and I would just say that I, I know that you guys probably have a lot of writers and authors that come and speak to you. Just like a little inside tip, if the author says, I want to introduce my book to you, and then turns to page like 137, they're probably doing something wrong. The beginning, if page one, chapter one isn't the opening to your book, um, well, then whatever is on 137 is probably what should be, uh, um, oh, it does skip a few times. Um, it should probably be there. So I'm just going to start from, the, uh, from page one here and just give you an introduction uh, to Mackenzie, who I stumbled upon in the Mackenzie River. The river was liquid glass, a cloud mirror that rolled beneath my canoe and made me dizzy, as if I might stumble and fall down into the heavens. 
and in the horizon, the silvery sky and water fused as one. We had been paddling for two days, and the river was so wide that the far bank appeared to be little more than a slight film of green. Reeds filled our shore, black ducks and seagulls in a steady succession of bald eagles feeding on both. Behind us, tumbling lake storms, and ahead, just a rumor of current. This river, the many nations of Dene, the indigenous peoples in the upper and middle basin, they know it as the De Cho. The Gwicha Gwichin of the lower interior bush, they call it the Nagwichunjik. The Inuvialuit, the western Inuit at the river's end in the Arctic, they call it the Kukpak. I, I should just say by the sec for a second. So I got to do the audio book um, for, for all my books, which was a great pleasure. I spent a day learning Nagwichunjik, Kukpak, and like these things that I had just read and never had to say out loud. All of these names, Decho, they're all variations on the same theme, the big river, and for good reason. It's the second longest in North America. The island that plugs the river's upper mouth is larger than five Manhattans. Everything about the Decho is enormous. And yet, I intended to canoe every drop of it, all 1,100 miles. I'm a fairly serious river guide, but never before had I undertaken a self-supported trip of this magnitude, and the scale of the journey weighed, on, weighed heavily on me. We paddled an 18 and a half foot sea clipper canoe, wide and steady as the days, designed to track through white caps and swallow hundreds of pounds of gear. I had spent half a year researching, purchasing, testing, sorting, packing, and repacking that gear. An Everest rated tent, solar panels and satellite link, a handcrafted curved splitting ax from Maine, 90 free dries dinners from Quebec, plus apples, mandarins, bagels, peanut butter, chocolate, oatmeal, tea, chunk honey, and 15 pounds of pemmican. All that and more stuffed in waterproof barrels or lashed to the boat so a rogue wave couldn't end our trip. That morning as we broke our first camp on the sandy shore of Great Slave Lake, I felt smothered by the scale of the job ahead of us, the labor required, the intense summer heat, the size of the river. It had taken two days of travel just to reach the starting line. Weeks and weeks yet to go to find the end. All day, the shore ground by reluctantly, grueling progress in the hazy shimmer. But then, unexpectedly and with great relief, a breeze stirred behind us. How did a breeze come out of the east? And the watery mirror shattered as wavelets formed about us. I unfolded the small sail we had brought for just such an unlikely development, clipped it to a metal bar at the nose of the boat, and when a gust caught us, I felt it tug hard against my line and we surged forward, surfing on and over the rising waves, making real headway for the first time. We paddled with ease and the wind filled our sail and the current increased as the river coalesced, and so by the end of that day, I felt it for the first time. The optimism, the promise, felt by the men and women who attempted the first recorded descent of this river, and whose path, in fact, I was following. For centuries, Europeans had been searching for a water route through North America. The mystical passage was known by many names, the Strait of Anan, the River Oregon, the Mare de West. Anyone who found it, mapped it, returned alive to tell the world would solve the greatest geographic mystery of the day and secure the riches and fame commensurate with such an achievement. Thousands of sailors and soldiers had tried and failed over the years, but none had explored the debt show, not until a party of fur traders and their indigenous partners launched an expedition in 1789. This river, its channel so wide and flat, the sides of a size of 100 Champs-Élysées, was the last best hope of finding a shipping lane through the continent. Midnight approached and the sun was just starting to curve towards the orange horizon. My face flushed in its glow, the, river, the wind drove us on, the river pulled us ever west, and I understood then, in that moment, why Alexander Mackenzie really did believe that in the De Cho, he had finally found a route to China, the fabled Northwest Passage. Oh, so, yes, as our photos are out of order, you're not supposed to smile in those kind of, like, badass... Um, 
you know, photos like that, right? Uh, but we had just disarmed. That's, uh, that's an EFP, an explosively foreign penetrator, which cuts through armor. And we had taken part, uh, one apart that night. That was in Kirkuk. Um, on one of my tours there, and so I was smiley. But I was supposed to be done writing about bombs. I was supposed to be writing instead about Alexander Mackenzie. So I don't know about you, but I learned in fourth grade that Lewis and Clark led the first expedition across North America. And I'm here to tell you that that's wrong, and my fourth grade teacher lied to me. <laughs> and and maybe, maybe yours lied to, yours, to you too. Uh, because the first recorded crossing... Um, allowing for some indigenous crossing that happened was never, uh, that went unrecorded. But the first one was not done by Lewis and Clark. It was done by Alexander Mackenzie. So let me tell you just a little bit about him. He was born in 1762 in Stornoway on the Isle of Lewis in far northern Scotland. And he was actually a refugee to America. Lots of Scots were fleeing that time. Gentleman's Magazine, which was a leading uh, English magazine at the time, it said that Scotland was full of nothing but dragons and owls. And, uh, and so people were fleeing, mostly to America. Unfortunately, Mackenzie landed in New York City in 1775, which was a bad time to be arriving there. He was a teenager. Uh, and since his family had just arrived and he was a, uh, uh, his father was a loyalist and joined uh, to fight on the side of the British, uh, the family fled north, first to the Mohawk Valley in upstate New York, and then eventually to Montreal, uh, where Mackenzie would become a fur trader. So Mackenzie made his great crossing of North America in 1793, when Meriwether Lewis was just a schoolboy and Sacagawea had not even been born yet. But that was actually his second expedition. His first one in, uh, was in 1789, and he went looking for the Northwest Passage, and instead he ended up finding the Arctic. So what, uh, remember that this is the time of the Voyagers, okay? So the Voyagers were like the bearded Arctic hipster pirates of their day, okay? So, and they were integral to the fur trade. So let me just tell you a second how the fur trade worked back then. If you had a lot of capital, if you were a fur trader in Montreal, you would order things like steel pots uh, or iron pots and ammunition and uh, blankets from London. It would take a long time for that stuff to come in. And then you would put it on canoes, enormous canoes that actually, interestingly, have a similar design to the one behind me. Um, these big 36-foot-long canoes made of birch bark, and then the voyagers would paddle all of these goods uh, up the Ottawa River or into the Great Lakes, uh, and then they would hand them off at the rendezvous, which was on Lake Superior. And then they, those goods would move further in, further west or further north. The traders up there, the Homme de Nord, which were the men of the north, they would spend all winter trading uh, furs for these finished goods, and then all the furs had to go back the next summer, get traded again at the rendezvous, come back up to Montreal, put on a boat, ship to London, and then actually the final destination for most of those furs was China, and they had to go all the way around the southern tip of South America. So your capital was exposed for three or four years before you got your money back. There was great incentive to find a way to get those furs out of North America in a better way than going all the way back through Montreal, London, uh, and back around. These canoes were enormous. Uh, the voyagers would paddle 18 hours a day. They would make 100 miles a day. They would run the portages. Uh, they would run with, they, everything was divided into what was called pieces, uh, 30 pounds each. They run with three of them on their back with a tump line. Uh, and it was like a dog scamper to go back and forth on these, on these portages. So Mackenzie was part of the Northwest Company, which, as was mentioned, uh, was the main rival to the Hudson's Bay Company. And for hundreds of years, ever since Cartier and Champlain uh, back in the early 1600s, everybody knew that the best furs were always to the north and to the west. The farther north you went, the farther west you went, you always got better furs. And that's because... Uh, up there, the winters were tougher, and so the beaver, they would call this the coster gras. It was the fur of the beaver at winter's height, when it was the biggest and thickest um, and thus most valuable. And so the Northwest Company built a series of posts all the way up into this land. Mackenzie's first posting was in Detroit, uh, and then he went on to Lake Winnipeg. There was just a problem as they moved inland on these canoes, and that's that they had no idea where they were going. So this, this map is not that old. This map is from 1780. So even as the American Revolution is being fought, 
Uh, the British and the soon-to-be Americans really have no idea what's going on, essentially, on the other side of the Mississippi or the Great Lakes. Uh, so obviously on the East Coast, things are, um, you know, kind of make sense, but then once you get to the interior, like, it doesn't make sense at all. So I'm going to point on this one. Obviously, the Rocky Mountains are in the wrong spot. Um, this is the Sea of the West, which is actually San Francisco Bay. Um, <laughs> But they think it comes all the way in here. We're obviously down here somewhere. This part was okay. N now we understand that the Northwest Passage kind of goes around Canada, right? But at the time, that's not what they believed at all. They thought that there was a way to go through the continent. And the way to go through uh, was either starting here in the Great Lakes or starting up in Hudson's Bay. And there was going to be a way to get through here somehow. And the, the name they gave for that was the Strait of Anan, which is a completely made up place. So there was, at the time, there was a field uh, of like serious study called speculative geography. And this is where very smart people would sit down and think of what geographic features must exist in the world. Now, this, this might sound crazy, but this comes from actually Aristotle, and he had what was called the balanced earth theory which stated that there had to be as much land in the northern hemisphere as the south and the eastern hemisphere in the west, and there would be similar geographic features in all of those places. And so this sounds like, you know, I guess logical, but doesn't, you know, doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, they, for a long time, believed that there must be a terra australis in the south to balance Asia and the north, and so they spent a long time looking for it, and they found Australia, obviously. So it, it had proved um, speculative geography had paid dividends. And so there was a belief that if you could get around South America to the south, you must be able to get around North America to the north. Um, and there must be this Northwest Passage. It was just a matter of where. So nobody knew where they were going, uh, except for a man named Peter Pond. And Peter Pond is fascinating. And he drew this map. So Peter Pond was born in Connecticut. Uh, he served in the French and Indian War. Uh, he was actually at the siege of Fort Niagara, which is very near where I live. Uh, he was the first uh, white man to cross the Medi Portage, which is the portage from the Hudson's Bay watershed into the Arctic watershed. He didn't know it was the Arctic, but he knew that on one side of this ridge, all the rivers ran east, and when he got to the other side, all the rivers ran west. And so they must be going into a different spot. And so what Peter Pond did is he was a fur trader, the same as Mackenzie. It's just uh, he was also really into maps. And so he was constantly trying to map where he was going. In this map, from basically the same time, is actually pretty good. So if I, can, uh, if I can see here, we start down in the Great Lakes. Yeah, that's pretty good. Lake Winnipeg, that's also pretty good. Um, he has different names for the Saskatchewan River and for the Churchill River, what we call them now, but those are in basically the right place. Lake Athabasca is in the right place. You know, you have this whole string of lakes um, starting in the Great Lakes in Winnipeg and Athabasca and Great Slave Lake and Great Bear Lake. You know, all of these lakes are essentially formed the same way. You have the Canadian Shield on one side and you have the Muddy Prairie on the other. And the reason these lakes are there um, is it's kind of like how next to a parking lot, you always get a puddle in the grass because all the water flows off the parking lot and kind of pools up. Well, that's what all these lakes are doing. And so he followed all these lakes all the way up. He gets up to Great Slave Lake off, um, off the Slave River, and he knows that he discovers this giant river flowing west into the setting sun. He also knows that Captain Cook, Captain Cook has come up a several times today, actually. Captain Cook has just gotten done with his journeys and has done essentially the West Coast and has done the Cook Inlet in what is modern-day Anchorage. And Captain Cook reported that there was a huge inlet and there was a big influx, influx of fresh water um, at about the same latitude as Pond knew where this other river was. And, he, and Pond says, I've got it. I've figured it out. These two rivers are the same river. So he draws this map, and you can't really read it, but up here it says, so far pond, and then over here it says, so far cook. And there's just like a little gap in between. Now, he, he doesn't really understand longitude, but he does understand elevation, and he knows he's pretty high. So he puts a rounding error in here, the greatest waterfall in the world. 
like 2,000 feet, like it was going to dump off. But it's the same river, and he's sure of it. So Pond draws this map. He takes it back to Montreal. He says, I figured it out, Northwest Company. I need, I'm going to do a three-day expedition down this river, and I will prove that I have found the Northwest Passage. There's just a problem. Uh, Pond has this habit of killing his business partners. You can read more about that in the book. But after killing the third guy, uh, eventually, and Pond is getting older, he's in his 50s, uh, the Northwest Company fires Pond and says, never mind, you're not going. There's this young whippersnapper, 25-year-old Alexander McKenzie. They give him Pond's map, and they give him a letter to Catherine um, in Russia, and they give him a bunch of rubles, and they say, take the river and then go find Russia and on to China. So, in the summer of 1789, 13 people in three canoes, they leave Fort Chipewyan, which is on Lake Athabasca. So let me say something about this crew of who are these 13 people that take this expedition. So first there's Mackenzie, and then there's his partner, Agina. Agina is a Chipewyan trading chief who also goes by the name of English chief because he is so powerful and all of the English traders are under his thumb. And let me just say something. I... I, to me, actually, the most fascinating character in my book is Augina. To me, he deserves to be at least as famous as Sacagawea or any other uh, indigenous partner. He is the great traveler in North America in the 1700s. He does the first descent of the Coppermine River with uh, Samuel Hearn. He does the first descent of what's now called the Mackenzie River. Um, he had not done these rivers before. They were new to him as well. Um, but he is going to be the translator for Mackenzie, and he kind of organizes things. Um, Mackenzie also has four voyagers, four French voyagers to paddle. He has a German clerk that comes with him, a man named Steinbeck, uh, who was a Hessian mercenary and deserted during the American Revolution and then goes up to be a fur trader. Uh, Algina also brings two hunters with him, uh, one of which happens to be his brother. And then Algina brings two of his wives, and the voyagers bring two of their wives. So it's nine men and four women. So I would like to say that this is like early feminism or something, but it's actually extremely practical. Uh, white men had tried to go down the Coppermine River, which I, I had said Augina did with Samuel Hearn, and they had always failed. And Augina said, the reason you are failing is you have not brought any women because women can carry more than men. They can do more work than men. Who is going to do all of the cooking? Who is going to do all of these chores? Uh, unless you bring women, we will fail. And so if the hunters were out killing game, uh, then they, they had to go and they had to kill and bring it back, and then the women would do the cooking. They would set up um, camp. Everything was very gender divided. And so this, um, this crew was really built for self-sufficiency. So it takes them 40 days to get to the ocean and back, um, but we know now it's the wrong ocean, right? Because, um, because unfortunately, as Mackenzie leaves Lake Athabasca, which I guess is about here, um, and goes up to Great Slave Lake, and he thinks he's just going to, like, connect. Um, but the Rocky Mountains are in the way, uh, and so is much of Alaska. And so he goes for a little while, uh, and he hits the Rockies, and he makes a big right-hand turn and starts going north. Um, but, but he doesn't know he's going the wrong way, and I'll get to more about why that is in a second. He gets to the end. He gets to the Arctic, um, to the Arctic Ocean. He doesn't realize he's in the wrong place until he gets to the Arctic, and he sees that the way is blocked by ice. And that's why he calls it the River of Disappointment. That's the name of the book. So this is why Mackenzie did a second trip in 1792 and 93. He starts from the same place, um, but instead of going north along the rivers, he basically crosses British Columbia. Um, and that's where he makes the first crossing of North America in a place called Bella Coola. Unfortunately, it's an absolutely horrendous journey. Uh, it takes him like a whole summer to get there and back. It's very slow. It's very rugged. Mackenzie's a businessman. Uh, he knows nobody is going to, he's looking for an easy way to get to China. That is not an easy way to get to China. He knows no one is going to follow him. And so he writes a letter to the governor general, and he says, though I was disappointed, my expedition proved without a doubt that there is not a Northwest Passage below this latitude. And I believe it will generally be allowed that no passage is practical in a higher latitude, the sea being eternally covered in ice. 
And when I read that, that's when I knew I wanted to write a book about Mackenzie because I'm going to give away the end of the book. There's no ice at the end of the Mackenzie River anymore because of climate change. Um, and I knew I would see something different. So in the summer of 2016, um, oh, we skipped ahead twice. I drove from my home in Buffalo, New York. A lot of people here probably think Buffalo is in the north. <laughs> uh, it's not, obviously. I drove all the way up to Great Slave Lake, got in a canoe, um, and then paddled the rest of the way on the Mackenzie River, which is about 1,200 miles, uh, to recreate that trip. So um, a, a bit about the trip. So I knew I needed friends to go with me. Uh, Nobody else, I was a full-time writer at the time, nobody else could take the entire summer off. So I found four buddies, and they each, like, took a turn. Like, I was, it was a relay race, and I was the baton, and they passed me off. So I always had somebody in the front of the canoe, and I had different friends. Uh, two of the guys, Senny right here, and Landon are, are both EOD techs. They're both bomb techs like me. Landon was in Baghdad when I was in Kirkuk. Senny worked for me. Um, we deployed together as well. They're reliable guys. Senny's a sailor. He brought his sextant along um, so uh, on the trip. Uh, so I knew they'd be reliable. Uh, David Christinger is from Wisconsin. He doesn't mind the cold. He spends a lot of time outside. He was a good friend. The odd man out uh, is Jeremy with the long hipster beard, speaking of, Jer of hipsters. So Jeremy... Um, I, was I had trouble finding a fourth person, and it was, I was running out of time. So I asked Jeremy to come. So you had heard The Long Walk, uh, my first book, got turned into an opera. And Jeremy is the composer of that opera. He is, I, I needed somebody that could drop everything, and so I picked somebody who also did not have a real job. Um, so he could, he could do that. Uh, poor Jeremy. I mean, he is the stereotype Brooklyn like person that you are thinking of. I did not find out until we were on the river that he had never slept overnight in a tent uh, or pooped in the woods. And the, the poor guy, like he got the runs. Um, so he got a lot of practice in that, in our time together. But you want to know what, by the end, he did great. Um, and I'm, I'm really proud of him. Uh, so ma mandatory gear picture. I think what I realized when I look up there at all the gear that I took, um, how much of it... Um, ended up like not being useful and how much of it ended up changing. I mean, the most, um, most important thing is the paddle, which is kind of off picture there. I had a, uh, a custom built paddle, a guy in West Virginia, you like send him the outline of your hand and he custom does the T grip on top to be like exactly the right size and diameter. It's, I mean, the thing weighed almost nothing. Um, it was really pretty incredible. Uh, satellite technology and stuff. The one thing I would say, the, I spent a lot of time thinking about what, um, what fuel to bring and what stove to bring, and I brought two. I brought like a traditional white gas stove, like an MSR stove, uh, and that's all the red uh, gas up there. And then I brought one of those stoves that will burn anything because I had no idea what I might find. And then three days into the trip, our canoe got broken into, if you can call that if a canoe can get broken into, like we were asleep on the bluff and we were in an indigenous town and in the middle of the night, um, they came and ransacked our canoe uh, and stole the gas from one stove and the stove of the other. And so I ended up, uh, ended up using a BioLite stove that I was able to like get in town. If you've never used a BioLite stove, you like build a little fire inside of a little pit and it like, you know, you can cook right on it and it'll burn anything, lichen in the tundra, like it doesn't matter. I will never use another stove again. You never have to worry about fuel. Uh, it's the best stove ever. I'll say that. Um, the, uh, the other two most important things, obviously the tent, I will, uh, uh, I've seen pictures of those Helleberg tents on Mount Everest at base camp. Uh, I would sleep in that tent the rest of my life. It's amazing. And then the, uh, the Kevlar canoe is, a, like I said, an 18 and a half foot sea clipper. Um, it's really big and really heavy, which was perfect because we had a lot of gear uh, and it would cut the waves. The biggest threat on the Mackenzie, uh, being a really wide river, is wind and white caps. So it's white caps driven by the wind. And so we really, it's like more like lake or, or ocean kayaking in some ways. Um, so it really just, it cut the waves incredible. Oh, I would say last thing, if you've never, I took this photo, I, I double checked the time, I took this photo at midnight. I don't know um, how many of you have done 24 hour light or 24 hour dark. Who's done either of those? A bunch of you had. I personally find 24 hour light way worse 
than 24 hour dark. Like, I don't know about you, but first, you like, you feel so overpowered, and I don't want to eat, and I don't want to sleep, and I just want to paddle, and I just want to go and go and go. And then, like, five days later, you're totally strung out, and you haven't slept, and then you still haven't slept for, like, 40 days, and you're a wreck by the end. So I'd rather do dark. Uh, so this is the Slave River. We didn't take the canoe on the slave. The slave is some of the biggest whitewater in the world. Um, and it is, uh, the whitewater is enormous. But not only that, the river is so wide. So I, I live very near Niagara Falls. Uh, the rapids remind me of the Niagara Falls rapids, except the river is the width of the Mississippi. And so when I got out there with the paddle club, the Fort Smith paddle club that took me out in a whitewater kayak, it's more like a ski resort where you, you don't, I mean, the rivers that I run back in New York, there's one line. Maybe there's two lines. Uh, on the Slave, there's 15 lines. Do you want to run the blue diamond? Do you want to run the green? Do you want to run the double black? Like, which one do you want to do? So we ran some blues, and I, you know, I got trashed by, uh, by the Slave. We call it a, a yard sale. I was just all over the place. Um, I mean, we're standing 30 feet above the rapid right there, looking out on it. Um, there's also breeding uh, pelicans. There's a pelican rooster like all the way up there. It's the northernmost in the world. It's kind of incredible. Uh, so this is, um, this is the Camsell Bend. This is the closest that the, the Mackenzie gets to the Rocky Mountains. So this is, and this is where it makes that big right turn north. So I said that Mackenzie didn't know that he was going the wrong way. And the reason is because he had a compass and he had a sextant, but he had two things working against him. One, he didn't understand that magnetic north was not north. He did not understand that magnetic north was actually uh, mostly to the east of him in many places and not to the north, especially in that part of even where it's moved. And then, um, in especially in the southern part of the river, um, it's much more like the front range of the Rockies and that you just get thunderstorms all day long. And of course, the sun's always out, so it's always heating, so there's always thunderstorms. So he can only take the Sexton reading at noon, and every noon there were thunderstorms. He never could get a look at the sun. And every time that he thought he was going west, he was really going northwest. And every time he, was going nor he thought he was going northwest, he was really going north. And so he was just turning. It was like having somebody at the wheel um, turning it, and he didn't realize. That's why he didn't realize where he was until the very end. So I have trouble articulating uh, how big the river is. Um, as you can see, it's a lot like the Santa Ana River that runs through Anaheim, where I went running today. That was, that was a joke. Um, that was an interesting run. Um, that, uh, I, I did get a good workout in. Anyway, I mean, so th the river is just so enormous. I mean, in a canoe, once you get out into the current, you have to plan on it being 45 minutes or an hour to get to shore. So you're, you have to plan pretty far ahead um, before you get stuck in something. That's a picture of Jeremy kind of sleeping on an island, and that's an ocean uh, container ship. Uh, they bring container ships all the way down, up and back. Um, and so it really is just... Um, it's huge. And I have to admit, I, I mean, in the book and then also to myself, I honestly don't call it the Mackenzie River very often. In my head, it's the Dead Show. It's the big river. Um, it seems kind of presumptuous. Uh, you know, Mackenzie did it once. Um, and it, I mean, Dead Show is a, much, is a much better name, I would say. We did bring a sail uh, where once in a while we got wind from the south or we got wind from the east. Uh, and these things, if you've never used uh, this... Uh, there's a company in Oregon that makes these. They almost work too well. So, the, I mean, the Mackenzie River, the current is, it's enormous. Um, so it's got like, you know, on average, I would say 7 to 12 knot current. And then with the sail, fastest we ever got it was like 27 knots, which is actually too fast. Like, because we were surfing and like on the waves, and then, uh, yeah, it, it started to get dangerous. We had to get off the river for going too fast. Um, yeah, so we, we actually, we used it, um, we used it sparingly. Uh, the two things that most people ask me about, or I'm sure people that have been up there, they ask about bears and bugs, right? So there's most kinds of bear. I usually say every kind. Somebody pointed out there's not panda bears up there. <laughs> There are, there are black, brown, grizz, and uh, polar bears at the end. Um, and so what we did for, for bears, uh, I decided not to bring a gun. Uh, we, we did think about it. Uh, really, 
I mean, you really only need a gun for polar bears. Polar bears will hunt you. Otherwise, bears not really going to hunt you. You can avoid them. I didn't really, I feel very comfortable with a firearm, but I, uh, it would really change your interactions, you know, going into a village or whatever else if you're armed or leaving the gun in the boat or whatever else. You decided not to. Uh, we took your normal bear spray. We took bear bangers. If you've never used those, it's like a pen flare, like a shotgun shell that goes on the end, and it makes a big flash and a big noise. Um, to make a bear run away. We never used it until the very end to celebrate, and then when we tried to put it in and fire it, it didn't go. So good thing we never had to do that. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of avoidance that you do. I mean, things like that I would recommend if you do in bear territory, you know, uh, stop, stop to eat dinner and then get back in your canoe and go for another hour or two. And that way you are never cooking in a place that you're sleeping. Get up, eat, get back in your canoe, like really separating the food from you. Um, we saw very few bears themselves. We saw lots of bear tracks. Um, Senny said, now we have to worry about Bigfoot was his um, comment on that. Um, and then on, on bugs, I have never, that video of the mosquitoes, I have not seen mosquitoes like that. I have seen um, bulldogs like that. Does anybody know bulldogs? We have a couple that know bulldogs. So I, for those that don't, yeah, so mosquitoes are bad. And then you have black flies, and we have those in the Adirondacks. Those are pretty miserable. And then you have deer flies that get bigger. Then you have horse flies. And then you have bulldogs. And bulldogs are like the size of your thumb. And they don't sting, they eat, right? So they stop and they bite and they like, they always go back to the places they've eaten before. So you have these sores, like where they just keep stopping and chewing all the time. And when you hit them, they don't die, right? You just kind of stun them because they're so big. So you would have to hit and like smear. And it was like, it's like a grape on the kitchen table. I, I, bulldogs, I'm, yeah, I'm done with bulldogs. Um, so, so it's not all wilderness. So um, in the Mackenzie Valley itself, there are a few towns. Um, one of the, you know, they're all about 400 to 800 people. They're all indigenous. This is Wilfred Jackson, uh, who's a Satu Dene elder who took us in. He took us in in Fort Good Hope. Um, one of the just incredibly generous man who's a, uh, he lives on, the, he still lives on the land and traps and, you know, subsistence for a lot. And so he fed us with very good food. That's where he lives. He's, uh, uh, his house is like kind of like moldering. It's like sinking into the permafrost. Of course, he drives around on the quad everywhere, as most people do. He's the most amazing women's tortoiseshell glasses that he wears while he does that. Um, but, uh, and then this is Our Lady of Fort Good Hope Church. Um, which is more than 100 years old, and it's just spectacular. And the thing about the Mackenzie River Basin is that it's mostly two colors. It's green and brown. It's brown water, brown banks, black spruce, which are green. It's brown and green and brown and green and brown and green. And so it was not a surprise to me that they would paint the church just the most vivid colors. Um, it's also known as Our Lady of the Cataract. So right at Fort Good Hope is the Ramparts, which is um, kind of like these big cliffs where the river like really narrows down and skirts through them. And there's a statue of the Virgin Mary in one of the, like a little cubby hole in one of the wall, rock walls. And the legend is that no matter how bad the floods are, that that, that statue has never been washed away. And it's because um, the Virgin Mary has stopped that. So um, they've all these like frescoes inside the, inside the church to Our Lady of the Cataract. So uh, we were talking before about being north of the Arctic Circle. On this trip anyway, after Fort Good Hope, which is where the Arctic Circle is, the weather really changed for us. Um, it's like a light switch. So you, you cross, uh, it's hot in thunderstorms south of the Arctic Circle, and then you get over there, um, and it was just rainy and cold and snow in July, uh, and just bleak, and it went from green and brown to basically gray um, constantly uh, every day. Uh, but part of one of these trips, right, is how fuzzy you get from it. So I got plenty, I got plenty fuzzy by the end. The one, uh, the one good part about getting so far north was the tundra. So, I mean, the boreal forest, uh, which is where all, you know the spruce and and everything, that basically stretches from Maine all the way to the Arctic Ocean. It's not until you get to the very, very end of the Mackenzie that you finally get the tundra. Uh, Senny described it as laying in the soap aisle 
uh, on a mattress because the t- it was so fragrant and the tundra was so soft. Um, that was that was our uh, that was our break, I guess. Um, so the Mackenzie Delta is kind of an interesting place. If you have uh, down here, the Mackenzie River comes in, and you have Sigachek, which is a uh, which is the only Gwich'in. Um, uh, settlement on the river. Uh, the Gwich'in are, are fascinating. One of their oral histories, uh, just as a slight aside, it's, it's fascinating to me. So they tell the story that time was cyclical. There was always a time for everything, you know, the summer and the winter and the fishing and the hunting, and time just went in a circle continuously until Mackenzie and his crew showed up. And then, since then, time has moved in a straight line. And so they really mark... Mackenzie is like a fundamental change in their nation's like story of themselves. I think it's, um, I think it's fascinating. So Mackenzie, as is, uh, maybe makes sense, he took the middle channel, which is the one you would think. Uh, we took the eastern channel because it goes by Inuvik. Uh, Inuvik means place of man. It's a completely fake mining town that didn't exist there since until in like 1970s. Uh, a Klavik, that means place of the bear. Um, that is like a more traditional indigenous settlement. You can drive, actually. You could get in your car right now and drive all the way to Tuktoyuk Duck. They've opened up the, the uh, highway all the way. Uh, the Dempster Highway always ran through Inuvik, but now it goes all the way to Tuktoyuk Duck. Uh, so our goal, where Mackenzie ended up, if you guys can see, this is Gary Island. Mackenzie called it Whale Island because of the beluga there. Um, and our goal was to get to the, to the same place. Um, to get to Gary Island, it's a five-mile open water crossing from the last island to Gary Island. Um, and then you're not really in the river. You're in the Arctic Ocean at that point. Um, and so that was her goal, but um, we kind of knew we weren't in control of that. The bicentennial, Canadian Bicentennial Expedition that did this route in 1989 got to the last island and then couldn't cross. The weather did not allow them to, like, you know, to get to Gary Island. The guy I talked to, he said, he looked outside and it was sleeting sideways and a red tail hawk was trying to fly into the wind and it was being pushed, like, backwards. And that's when the exp- their expedition said, never mind, we're canceling, we're going home now. So when we got to point separation, we knew it was about four days to get all the way to Gary. Um, and we... Uh, you know, it was going to be up to the weather. So there was a weather window. We knew four days out that it was basically going to be 32 degrees and sleet and 30 knot winds in that place um, because, you know, we, we had the advanced weather software. It was going to be basically those weather conditions, except for like a three-hour window four days away at exactly the right time. So if that window held, we were going to be able to make the crossing. It kind of felt like doing an alpine summit, like... If, if your weather is going to work, it's, um, it's going to happen, and if not, it's not. So we get there. Our window is there. Uh, we, it's, uh, the wind's not that bad. The sleet's not that bad. We decide we're going to try it. We do the five-mile crossing. We get halfway out, and, of course, what happens? The wind and the sleet, right? So we ended up making it. Um, and what did we find when we got to Gary Island? We found a hunter's cabin, and his quad, right? And like tables with ulu knives for, for skinning the beluga. And I, I had the feeling that maybe some of you have had uh, that like for many other people for hundreds or thousands of years, I had traveled very, very far to a place that I considered the end of the world. And what I discovered was somebody's home, right? And somebody, the people that had been there for a long, long time. Um, and so that was humbling. So Gary Island is full of essentially all the driftwood in the world um, and, and this hunter cabin. So um, I, I'm going to leave you with two more thoughts. We got to Gary Island, and then we got sleeted in. We had, uh, we had several days on that island uh, to sit by the fire and sleep uh, and recover, um, try to gain back some weight. The thought that I had while I was there was, why am I here and why am I doing this? Uh, Which I'm sure is a thought that many of you have had as well. Uh, I I don't know about you, but the idea that why do you climb the mountain because it's there, that has never been satisfactory for me. And so most of this trip for me was trying to answer that question for myself in a legitimate way. Why do this trip? 
I guess write a book about it, but that's, that's not really much of an answer. But why do trips like this? Why put yourself through the suffering? Who, who are you trying to prove something to? Are you trying to prove something to yourself? Are you trying to prove something to each other? Um, what, what answer do you have to the question of why do this? Um, the answer that I eventually came to for myself uh, is that the only reason to do something like this is to bring back some knowledge or some truth that it was not possible to discover some other way. Um, and so David mentioned that now actually I'm not a full-time writer anymore. Uh, I'm a full-time war crimes investigator. And so I guess in some ways I still do, Megan and I, we talked about this um, a bit today on the boat. It's like uh, if you still have the wanderlust, um, if you still have the feeling that, you know, um, the, the feeling of wanting to be out there. Well, what are you doing that makes the trip worth it, that contributes something? And for me, the answer is now I go places like Libya and Somalia and investigate crimes that nobody would investigate and nobody, unless you actually got there, there would be no way to pull the bomb frag out of the crater and, and figure out who did, who did whatever. So that's my answer for myself. Uh, I challenge you to come up with an answer for your, for your, on your own. Let me just end with what Mackenzie's answer was to that question about why do any of these trips. His answer was, uh, there was no reason except money. And he considered himself a failure uh, until he died. Uh, he basically drank himself to death in 1820. Um, in reality, uh, I would say that Mackenzie was not a failure. He was just 200 years too early. Imagine if when he did that trip, there's a little thought experiment I will end on. Imagine if he had done that trip, and instead of not seeing ice, imagine if he had seen open ocean. What would he have done then, and where would he have gone? Would he have gone around Alaska? Would he have ended up in Russia and China after all? Um, Lewis and Clark are famous because people followed them, because there was an Oregon Trail, because there was the westward expansion, because of all of that. I, I wonder if he had not seen ice, if the entire history of our continent would have been written differently, if there would have been a Mackenzie Trail, if there would have been people that moved up there and followed, if there would have been all of the shipping, if, if there would have been, um, yeah, just a, a completely different way that history unfolded um, for, for our country, for Canada, would there be a Canada, would there be a United States the same way? Hugh McLennan, who's a novelist, he traveled the Mackenzie River in Barge in 1961. And he predicted that in 100 years, in 2061, that 2 million people would call the Mackenzie River Valley home, and it would be full of universities and et cetera, et cetera. Today, I guess halfway down his, um, his, uh, his 100 years, today there's 10,000 people that live in the Mackenzie Valley, which is essentially the same number as lived there as when Mackenzie took his trip. So it is a... Uh, um, how history might have been written different, I think, is an interesting question. With many great ideas, uh, including Mackenzie's about the Northwest Passage, I would say things are often a matter of timing. And that's the big idea I'll leave you on. So thank you very much for your attention and for having me here.